under this evening's service.
this morning we look at the, the greatest commandment that we find in the scripture. Christ was asked, which is the greatest commandment. And he said, Mark 12, verse 30, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Meaning that it is the most heavy one, most weighty one, the one that's really important. And therefore Christ was asked the question and he gave the answer. This is the greatest commandment. But Christ didn't stop right there because in verse 31, he added to it what will be the second greatest. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. So after giving the first greatest, he wasn't asked what's the second greatest, but he said, I'm going to tell you what the second greatest is. You must love your neighbor as yourself. And he says there's no two greater commandments than these commandments right here. And think about this. If the world were to follow commandment one and commandment two, think of what a greater world we'd live in. A world of peace, a world where we look after each other, a world where we cared for each other. There wouldn't be all the mishaps and the anger and the killing and the murder and all that, all those things that happen. If we could put forth these two commandments in the world, certainly it would be a greater place to live. But we know the odds of that are happening are, are slim to nothing because individuals simply will not follow that. Those are the ways of God. So here, what Jesus is saying, the first commandment, the second commandment, it's really nothing new. Because we go to the Old Testament there, we find early on in the laws of God, where these commandments were given. Like Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. In Leviticus 19, 18, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So if we would just obey these two, what we find in here and find in the New Testament, what a great place it would be to live simply because we love the Lord and we love each other. But this morning we saw where that individual came to Christ and he did so in tempting Christ, trying to trip him up as to what was the first and great commandment there in Mark 12, verse 28. And the man who asked this question here, well, he was genuine. Two individuals came before him trying to confuse and trip Christ up. But the third man, he was certainly uh, genuine, had an honest heart about him. And it said that one of the scribes came, having heard them reasoning together, perceiving he answered them well. Ask him, which is the first commandment of all. So here's the individual, honest heart, sincere heart. He wanted an answer to the, uh, this most important question, and certainly Christ gives him an answer. And he liked it. He understood this. Well, Christ, you're right. This is the right answer. And then the scribe had a little bit more to say to Christ in verse 32. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth. For there is one God and there is no other but, other but he. And to love him with all your heart, with all the understanding, with all, your, all the soul, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, it's more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. So this scribe, he understood what Christ was talking about. You're right. Love the Lord. Love your neighbor. This is the most important. Greater than any burnt offering, any sacrifice that one could give. And Christ said, you're right. And here Christ again says to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. I wonder if this man, this scribe, did he ever become a disciple? Did, did he forget about the ways of the Jewish learning and, and realize I can learn a lot more from this man, Jesus? And did he become a disciple? <clears throat> or maybe after Christ died, did the man then become a Christian? Did he study the scriptures more and realize that Christ was the one that fulfilled all the scriptures of the Old Testament there 
and he was the son of God. I don't know, scriptures don't say, but I feel pretty good about this man because he had an open heart, he was honest, he wanted to learn, and I believe at least he became a disciple, Maybe or later on he did become a Christian. But this is not the first time that somebody asked this question. What is the greatest commandment? In Luke 10, in verse 25, we find another lawyer or scribe, and he comes to Christ. It says, A certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So here comes this other lawyer or the scribe. And he's like some of those others we read about this morning. He came testing Christ. Wanted to see, do you really know the answer to this? Trying to trip him up. And he asked the question. And what Jesus does, which he does many times in the scriptures, he would answer the question with a question. What is written in the law? How do you understand that? What about it? So here he puts the man on the spot, <clears throat> trying to see how much he knew. And of course, the man described he knew. In verse 27, so he answered and said, <clears throat> there's some water here. So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, <clears throat> with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. So here's this particular lawyer, he, he knew the verses as well. He knew to go to Leviticus 19, 18, what we just read, where it said to love your neighbor. He knew to go to Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5, where it says, put God first, love him with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind, all of that. He knew that. And I wonder after Christ said to him, well, this is right. What did he think about himself then? Was he a little bit embarrassed because he asked such a, a question he already knew the answer to? Well, if he did... Well, then it comes out maybe in verse 29 because then he has another question. He said, but he wanted to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? He wanted to come across as a, as a righteous man, he wanted to justify himself for asking that question. Yeah I, yeah, I know I knew the answer to that question. I just want you to help me, Lord, to understand who is my neighbor. Well, his definition of neighbor for this man here was somebody who was of the same, uh, same Jewish relationship to him. It had to be another Jew. A Jew would not really even take on the thought of anybody else being his neighbor. A Jewish individual would not walk into the home of somebody that was not Jewish. A Jewish individual would not eat a meal that was cooked in somebody's home other than a Jew. So when it said, who's my neighbor, he's thinking another Jewish person. His thinking is that Christ is going to say, well, you're Jewish brethren. He's your brother. He's the one that you should really take, to, take time with and love. But Jesus has got another plan. He's going to really teach this man now who his brother really is. And that's what brings Christ to verse 30 to speak the parable of the Good Samaritan a parable that I'm sure that we know well. It says here beginning, and then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. So here's a priest who is a Jew. Here's a Levite who is a Jew. Uh, these are brothers of that man who asked the question, who my brother is. And they come across this man, a Jewish individual, leaving to Jerusalem, been there to worship, and here he is on the side of the road, practically dead. And what do they do? They pass by on the other side. They do not want to get close to this man because if they get close to him and they somehow accidentally touch him, that means that they're unclean, they're impure. And they have to go through this cleansing ceremony 
before they can do anything once they get to Jerusalem there themselves. So they see this man probably at a distance. They realize he's hurting. They realize because of me all the blood and the scars and cuts and all that's there. If he's half dead, he may be moaning a little bit. Who knows? But they purposely look the other way. They don't want to be of, of any kind of help to this particular man. So now this particular uh, this lawyer now, this scribe, is hearing this parable. And whenever Christ says, here comes the priest, oh yeah, he's going to help. But he walks on by. When Christ says, here comes the Levite, oh, it's the Levite that's going to do some helping. But then he walks on by. And then Christ continues in verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I will come again, and I will repay you. When he saw him, he had compassion. And probably this Jewish individual, the lawyers, the scribe here, he's been, I'm, I'm confused when Christ tells this. Why would a Samaritan help this Jewish man on the side of the road who is half dead? Why would he do that? And he's trying to, trying to get all this stuff fil filtered out. Why didn't the priest do it? Why didn't the Levite do it? Why is this Samaritan do it? Why is Christ trying to get a hold of me here? What he's trying to say and then Christ says to him, so which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. That lawyer that heard Christ say this, and then in verse 36, the lawyer asked him who was neighbor to this man. What else could he say? He couldn't say the priest was. He knew that was wrong. He couldn't say the Levite was. He knew that was wrong. And he didn't want to say anything about the Samaritan because that's just not the way it's supposed to work. A Samaritan is not to be helping a, a Jewish individual. It, don't, it doesn't work that way. But he had to say it. Even though he knew the answer, he went ahead and said, yes, it was the Samaritan. If you notice there in verse 37, he didn't say Samaritan. He just said the one who showed mercy. The one who showed mercy. So in this particular parable, you have four main characters. You had the priest, who was a Jewish individual. He was responsible for leading the people in worship. You had the Levite, another Jewish individual. He was responsible for making sure everything was ready for worship. Then you had the Samaritan, and you didn't want to be a Samaritan. That was the lowest of the lowest of the people. A half-breed, they called them. Half-Jew, half-Gentile. Uh, the Jews had nothing to do with them. The uh, Gentiles had nothing to do with them. They're at the bottom of the list when it came to individuals that had the respect of the people. So here is this man, a Samaritan, and he's helping a victim who is a Jewish man. I guarantee you that if, the, if, the, if this had been different, if it had been the Samaritan man on the side of the road and the victim was walking and saw him, he too would have taken a long path around. He wouldn't have that Samaritan. They could care less if they lived or died. No difference to them. They were just uh, this common trash. But you don't find Christ talking about the Samaritans throughout the scriptures that way. Christ always built these individuals up. He lifted them up. Here he puts the Samaritan as the man who helped. Nobody would have thought it had been him. And if they had a multiple choice here, priest, Levite, Samaritan, who would it have been? It wouldn't have been a Samaritan, not the top of the list. But yet he did. Remember when Christ healed the ten lepers and one returned, he was a Samaritan that said thank you for this healing. Whenever Christ saw the woman at the well and there speaking with her, that was a Samaritan woman. 
He's showing over and over and over again the Samaritans have value. They have value. They're created in the image of God, and therefore they are special. And don't be looking down upon them by any means. Do that. He's trying to build the people up confidence, so showing that everyone is special in the eyes of that of God. So here's a priest who sees his brother on the side of the road and does nothing. A Levite who sees his brother on the side of the road and does nothing. And a Samaritan who sees this man who despises him on the side of the road and yet he has compassion for him. Who would have thought it would have been the Samaritan? that would have done this, but it was. And if we go back to verse 33, we notice here, he had compassion, so he went to him. Remember the, the second greatest commandment? To love your neighbor as yourself. That's what the Samaritan was doing. He was loving this man as himself. He certainly would hope if he found himself in that situation that somebody would help him, that somebody would have compassion for him. In Mark 12, 31, again, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Again, the two greatest commandments here. Love the Lord your God first. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is second. It means more than just thinking about compassion. Well, sometimes we'll, we'll see something. It may be on television or read about it somewhere. A diff- person have a difficulty and we'll say, man, that's terrible. I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. That's terrible. What can be done to help them? It's one thing to think it, but something else to take part in it, to take action. This man, he had compassion, and he went to him. And by going to him, he had to be inconvenienced greatly. Because here he was. He was en route to go somewhere, and yet he had to stop and help this man. He had to get off his animal. Maybe it was a donkey. He was riding that donkey, Pretty smooth ride, I guess, but now he's going to have to be walking. He puts the the victim on his donkey. He has to go out of his way to get him to this inn. He then has to come up with money to pay for his care, money money that he probably already had laid aside for another need or another cause, and now he's helping this man. He was inconvenienced. It meant he had to sacrifice something. And to go out and to help our neighbor... When they have need, it may very well mean I have got to sacrifice. It may be my time, and we're tied on time, but it may be we don't say no more. Somebody else needs to do it. Maybe we need to do it. We, if we can, we ought to do such as this. See, the Samaritan, he was the one who was the neighbor. He was the one who had compassion. He was the one that was inconvenienced. He was the one that made the sacrifice to help this man, and he took action. The first and greatest commandment. Again, we're told that. And how we handle these two greatest commandments. I mean the greatest. It's going to say a lot how we handle the two other least commandments. Because if we don't handle these so well, what's to say we're going to handle all the other commandments that God has given to us well also? Again, as I said this morning, you know, if this is the greatest commandment, these two, what is the greatest sin? What is the greatest sin? Could it be the greatest sin is not loving the Lord our God as we should? And the second greatest sin is not loving our neighbors ourselves. Again, we, we can do more. We can do better. What are we doing? Hopefully we're doing a lot in this area, but we can do better. We can do that because these are the greatest laws that God gave us. Loving God and loving our neighbor. That's what we want to be. We want to be the best Christian we can be the most faithful Christian we can be and trying to give the example that Christ wants us to give and showing our love and care for others. And we need to do that. If we're doing it, that's great. If not, step it up and do something about this. Again, one day we might find ourselves one on the side of the road needing help. And who's going to help us? Tonight, if you're not a Christian, again, these two great commandments, loving God and loving your neighbor, again, to be a Christian it's, it's the greatest commandment, one of the greatest commands God gives as we put these things in action and begin serving God and begin serving others. If you've not been baptized in Christ, we'll not do so tonight and become that child of God.
or it's a Christian who just needs to be stronger, just make that commitment. I'm going to do better. Starting today, I can do better. I will. Or it may be we need to pray about this and put things back in the right order. That need is there in any way tonight. Please come as we stand and sing.